Well, good morning. Welcome to worship with New Bethel Baptist Church, and happy Mother's Day for those of you who uh, are, are claimed as a mother by somebody. Glad you are here to worship with us on what is turning out to be a, a, a beautiful summer-like day, although we're due after all the rain this week. I don't know about you, when I mowed my grass, I contemplated either uh, getting out the lawnmower or getting a goat from one of my friends because the doggone grass was so high. Um, but what's behind us, now we have a moment to pause, to celebrate, to worship our God. Let's stand uh, and we're going to sing a, a great hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy. Let's stand and sing together. watches over us, God provides for us, God nurtures our spirit. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We worship the Lord God Almighty for the wonderful action accomplished through Jesus. Praise be to you, our Lord, for your work of salvation. Please bow in prayer with me. Heavenly Father, we say good morning and how thankful we are to be in your presence. We celebrate this Mother's Day with our mothers, whether they're here on earth or have joined you in heaven. We give thanks for their many blessings and ask you to watch over them while they're here. Be with us this morning, Heavenly Father, as we learn more of your words and strive to be better Christians as we depart this place. Be with us now as we pray that beautiful prayer saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please join in the singing of hymn number 793 for the beauty of the earth. Our hymn of grateful 
for thy church that evermore lift his holy hands above, offering upon every shore her pure sacrifice of love. Lord of all, to thee we praise this our hymn of grateful praise. Divine to the world so free. seated. Today our scripture reading is from the second book of Samuel, chapter 7, verses 1 through 17. When King David was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all the surrounding enemies, the king summoned Nathan the prophet. Look, David said, I am living in a beautiful cedar palace, but the ark of God is out there in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, Go ahead and do whatever you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night the Lord said to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, This is what the Lord has declared. Are you the one to build a house for me to live in? I have never lived in a house from the day I brought the Israelites out of Egypt until this very day. I have always moved from one place to another with a tent and a tabernacle as my dwelling. Yet no matter where I have gone with the Israelites, I have never once complained to Israel's tribal leaders, the shepherds of my people Israel. I have never asked them, why haven't you built me a beautiful cedar house? Now go and say to my servant David, This is what the Lord of heaven's armies has declared. I took you from tending sheep in the pasture and selected you to be the leader of my people, Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have destroyed all your enemies before your eyes. Now I will make your name as famous as anyone who has ever lived on earth. And I will provide a homeland for my people, Israel, planting them in a secure place where they will never be disturbed. Evil nations won't oppress them as they've done in the past. Starting from the time I appointed judges to rule my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Furthermore, the Lord declares that he will make a house for you, a dynasty of kings. For when you die and are buried with your ancestors, I will raise up one of your descendants, your own offspring, and I will make his kingdom strong. He is the one who will build a house, a temple for my name, and I will secure his royal throne forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. If he sins, I will correct and discipline him with the rod like any father would do. But my favor will not be taken from him as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from your sight. Your house and your kingdom will continue before me for all time, and your throne will be secure forever. So Nathan went back to David and told him everything the Lord had said in this vision. May God bless the reading of his word. I love the story of of, of David and the Hebrew monarchy, and today the promise that God would secure David's house completely over the course of uh, history, actually, even to this very day. It is Mother's Day. Um, I did want to say thank you. I I think you saw that my mom passed away last weekend, and we had her memorial service yesterday. Thank you to everyone who reached out in all the different ways that you did. Mom was ready. She was faithful. Um, I have memories of her bringing me to that church before I could read or walk, and Um, In fact, I remember attending church with her and my uh, grandma, who always had fruit stripe gum after church. So those of you who hand out candy or treats after church, um, I remember. It gives me great memories all the time. So 
One of the things, though, that my mom did that I think a lot of us are here for today is she nurtured my faith. She nurtured my spiritual development even from the very beginning. And I thought that as we go and, and pray for not just our moms, but for those women who have impacted our faith and its growth, that we pause to say thank you to God. This is also a time as our prayer to come and bring our cares and our worries before God and to confess them. So let's, let's go to God in prayer together. I cast all my cares upon you. I lay all of my burdens down at your feet. And any time that I don't know what to do, I will cast all my cares upon you. Our Lord God, first we pause to bring to you the cares, the concerns of our heart, the rejoicing, Lord, the joy that we share with you for the accomplishments of the last week or the last years. Lord, hear our prayers of thanksgiving. Lord, please respond to our prayers of supplication. Lord, we are also here this day to honor our mothers, those women in our lives who have cared for and nurtured us. Today, Lord, we thank you for their faithful witness, not just through our years, Lord, but through countless generations. Of the way these women that we have known and have heard stories of have cared for, have loved us, have sheltered us, and protected us of those mothers who have prayed for their children ceasingly, who have made great sacrifices. Lord, we know that your love is even more than they could give. So we say thank you for the way you have opened our eyes to how love can truly transform us. Lord, as those ladies love us, as we love one another, we pray that your love might be discovered in that process, and that through our relationship with one another, we might learn and, Lord, discover the power of your love in our lives. Thank you for that love which sustains us this day. Amen. You know, why don't we go ahead and sing Find Us Faithful? It's hymn number 456. I don't think we've sung this hymn since I have been here. It's a gorgeous hymn. Let's sing it twice to make sure you really get it. And why don't you stand when you sing, or you sing better when you stand. So if you can, let's stand up.
one of me to tell everybody that beginning tomorrow morning, Thompson and Southeastern is going to become a four-way stop. So everybody be careful until you get used to that. We didn't want any risk. I don't either. And I know everybody else doesn't. So thank you. I know two people that come right through that. That entire family comes through that area. Uh, I'd like to take this moment at, uh, for the mission moment to thank everyone uh, who donated to the America for Christ offering. Janie let me know that we did exceed our $750 uh, budget or our goal, so thank you. Thank you to each and every one of you that donated. We've closed that offering. Our next one, I believe, is our one great hour of sharing. So we'll have information coming out about that very soon. But more specifically, I want everyone to put on their calendar, whether it's your digital calendar or your written calendar, this date. Everybody listening? July 14th. What's happening on July 14th, Dick? Bruce Borquist. <laughs> I think this is a fantastic opportunity for us to gather together with Bruce, and I, I believe it's only going to be Bruce himself, correct? So please put that on your calendar. We will have a light dinner with Bruce, so hopefully by giving you all this advance notice, you can clear your calendar for that evening. I think, again, it's an excellent opportunity for us to show our hospitality to Bruce, as well as our thanks for the commitment he and his family have made towards you know, sharing God's gospel throughout the world. So we'll work on, uh, more specifically, a menu for that evening as the date grows closer. But seeing as how it's only May, and that's in July, you got plenty of time to keep that date open. So we want to make sure we have as many people out that evening. I believe it's a Thursday evening. Didn't we state that, Dick? Thursday evening, July 14th, and we're probably looking at around 6 o'clock. And I'm sure uh, Bruce will have lots of stories and lots of information he can share with us. So please uh, be there if at all possible. Thank you. Thinking about uh, today being Mother's Day and wanting to make sure we honored them, I went to Mark chapter 3, verse 31 for our scripture to think about for today. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived, standing outside. They sent someone, to, someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers, he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Well, as you can imagine, this has been a weird Mother's Day for me. Having the service yesterday for my mom's passing and going through all that. Actually, it was completely unintentional, but the first song, when my mom passed, she left instructions on her computer and actually had given the church a note. She had planned out her entire service. She gave us the scripture passages she wanted. She gave us the hymns she wanted us to sing. She made very specific instructions that my role was to be there as mourner and not as pastor. Um, she did all those kinds of things. And yesterday when we got together, um, we had a great time talking about her and, and going through that process. By the way, I will also point out this. My mom, just to give you a little, my mom loved cats. And I don't mean loved cats. I mean loved cats. Like, we would call her the crazy cat person. We had a tenth of her little kitten tchotchkes that were there. And on the altar was a scrapbook that she had made for one of her cats that she loved so much. She never made a scrapbook of any of us children, 
but she had one of her cat. All right, that that helps you to to understand that whole process. So, um, but what really happened, and I think what's important is that I do remember I talked about it. My mom, I insisted that we go to church um, every Sunday morning when I was little. She would get myself, my younger brother, my older brother, and older sister up. We'd all get dressed, we'd eat breakfast, and then we'd go pick up my grandma, who lived pretty close, and we would all go to church together. And that happened for as long as my grandma was healthy enough, and then even after she stopped coming, we went. And it wasn't an option. I don't remember ever even trying to fight about it. We all just knew we got up and went. And even though the fruit stripe gum was good, um, it was not the reason why I went. I mean, it was the bonus at the end of the day. Um, but I think about that because I think about the way that my mom helped nurture my own spiritual faith. I remember the, the semester, I was in graduate school at, em, at Candler in Emory, and I was reading Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and I decided right there that I wasn't going to stay at, at Emory, and I was going to transfer to Christian Theological Seminary and go to seminary, and I remember calling her and saying, I don't like the school, I don't like these people, they're all crazy here, um, I think I'm supposed to go to seminary. And I just remember there was this dead silence on the phone. And then I heard this loud sob. I assumed it was for joy, not for fear about what would happen if I went to seminary, and because I... At one point, I think I said, I'll go to seminary when hell freezes over, and my mom might have been worried about that. But I know that for her, it was something that she'd been praying about for all of us for a long time. And as we come up on this Mother's Day, I think it's important for us to recognize that there were women who have impacted us. For me, I go back to the women nowadays that still have an impact upon my spiritual life. And and some of them are people I know and I care for. Some of them have been some of you there. I, I got a call from someone from this church this week, a lovely woman who said, Tom, are, do you want us to get someone to preach for you after everything you've been through? And I wanted to say, thanks, Mom. Thanks, Mom. I appreciate what you did or, or your offer, but you know, I'm, I'm going to be okay. That's the kind of nurturing that we talk about. At the same time, I also remember being younger, and being married and wanting to have children and having a difficult process in that. I mean, before Kelson was born, before we found out we were pregnant with Kelson, we'd spent about two and a half years with fertility issues. And I remember how difficult that was for Jessica because a lot of, and this is what it's hard for us to understand, a lot about being ident- identifying as a woman has to do with that ability to be able to bear children. And so every Mother's Day was torture for her. Every time another one of our friends announced that they were pregnant, it hurt. And I know there are still people around here who are struggling with that. They could even be people from our own church or family from our own church. I know that for some of us today, this might be the first year we've had a Mother's Day without our own moms to celebrate. And that can be difficult. Let's be honest, even if you've had, this is the first year or the 50th year, it can be difficult sometimes. And so I think it's important just for us at the beginning of this to realize that yes, we should honor our mothers, those women who have cared for and nurtured us. We should also be honored as women who care and help develop. You know, it's one of the reasons why I believe a lot of American Baptist churches started um, permitting women as deacons is because they admitted finally that women had been running the church for a long time. Spiritually, at least. And in some cases, in most cases, better than most of the men who were in charge. Let's be serious. In fact, one of the things that happened to me Yesterday was one of the members of that church who I'd known for a long time. He came up to me and he said, Tom, I remember when your mom was the moderator of this church. Because she ran it according to Robert's rules of orders. And you had time to speak. And if you presented something ahead of time, she would let you. And if you didn't, 
she didn't have time for you on that agenda. She said, I hated it, and it also forced me to get my act together. And I said, you know, thank you. She really wasn't that way at home, but I'm glad she could do that for, for the church leadership. That's the kind of thing that we talk about. The other aspect for this, for me, is thinking about as impactful and influential as my own mom has been in my life, she's not the only person who has nurtured me. You know, I go back to the days when I was in undergraduate work, and, and we studied um, a, a woman, she was a, she's a, a professor at, at um, the graduate school at uh, Vanderbilt University. Her name is Sally McFaig. And she wrote a book that talked about the way we refer to God and said that sometimes referring to God as Father is difficult if we have had a Father who has been neglectful or abusive. And her argument is that we need to introduce, not do away with those, but introduce new ideas. God as Mother, the one who loves and cares for, nurtures us. God as Artist. And you know, it, for, for me, I, I fi it finally happened this week. Some of my tulips, the petals have finally started to fall off. And when I finally got to mow yesterday, I saw those on the grass. And I just thought, God did so good with the tulips in my yard. Better than I could ever possibly do. And I was grateful for that. Just the artistry of the world. Right now, um, my big thing are, have you, have you seen the lilacs in bloom? Okay, it's a tradition in our house. If you have a lilac bush, I will pro let me know because I will stop by your house with a pair of scissors because it is a long-standing tradition in our house to steal lilac blooms anywhere we find them, much to my 20-year-old um, son's horror. Dad, we're going to get arrested. Yeah, but it's for a good cause. There's a lot of beauty in the world. I think about the, the, the people who I've read Recently, um, I'm, I'm a big fan of a woman named Rachel Held Evans, and she is a woman who kind of broke out of a conservative evangelical tradition and began to ask questions about questions from the Bible, and it led her faith to grow in ways that we would never have guessed. And, and I remember some of the, the words that she has, has shared and posted. Unfortunately, she died just a couple of years ago from all things. It was um, the flu. She got the flu and it got out of control and she passed. I think about Nadia Boltz Weber, who is this crazy pastor who founded a church. It's called um, House for Saints and Sinners out in Denver, Colorado. And she's a tattooed, a little bit sometimes unorthodox Lutheran pastor. And she approaches Scripture in ways that are so enlightening to me. She understands it, and she, I, I really consider her a, a contemporary prophet with the way she's able to read and, and, and has this incredible ministry of unconditional love for people. And, and a lot of her church are the vagrants and the broken and the lost and the marginalized people in, in their world, and she has called them together and somehow woven them into this tapestry of dangerous and, and crazy and messy faith, but it works. You know, I, I think about other, other kinds of, of women who I've encountered. Um, one of my favorite ladies uh, just passed away. She was the chairman of one of my search committees back in Evansville, Indiana. And I remember at some point um, going through the call process, and, and I remember that the pastor called me and talked to me and said, hey, we've gone through everything, and, and the the church, we want you. The search committee, we want you to come and we want to set up a candidate Sunday. And I was like, I don't want to go to Evansville. There's nothing in Evansville. Sorry if you're from Evansville. It's so far away and it's not connected. And we really felt like God was calling us to Bloomington, not Evansville. And I remember getting off the phone and then immediately she called me and she said, what a letter get to you first. I'm like, yeah. And she goes, ah pastors like that and she said i hope you won't be one of those people and i said honestly bev i'm not even sure we're supposed to go there and she goes okay okay she goes well sure we're trying to figure out what god wants and we think god wants you here and i think god wants you here but if you're not so sure 
let's listen. I remember getting off the phone with her and, and looking um, at Jessica and saying, I don't want to go to Evansville. She's like, I'm not going to Evansville. I'm like, why are we still having this conversation? And at some point I remember, it was after Bev, I, I'm like, maybe it's because that's where we're supposed to go. And we both kind of looked at each other like, ah, it is. I would never have gotten to that point. In fact, I remember coming and, and, and Bev was taking me around the town and showing me around. I said, you know, I probably never would have been open to this if you hadn't said what you said. And she smiled at me and she got this little twinkle in her eye and she goes, I figured. Just one of those things, man, you might think you're in charge in your relationship with every, whatever woman you are. You're not. Okay? In fact, somewhere there's, there's a man who looks at his wife and goes, really? And she goes, of course you're in charge, honey. We know better. That takes us to the scripture for today. And why? Good, good. I see it happening right now. That's what takes us to the scripture for today. And we read this story. We've read it before. You know, I, I'm sorry. We probably should have gone back earlier in this chapter because this is the second half of a Mark and Sandwich, right? We read this, Jesus' mother and brother show up outside. They want to get in. The, the room is so crowded, they can't even get in. So they send word to him, and Jesus says, who are, my, here are, who are my mother and brothers? Here are my mothers and brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Just a little bit earlier in this passage, we're told that Jesus' family, this is in verse 20, Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. That busy, that crowded. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. All right? That's, when we, remember when we went through the, some of you were here, we went through the Gospel of Mark, and we read this passage, and we learned about Mark and sandwiches, how Mark takes the story, and he splits it in half, and he sticks another story in the middle of it, and the whole thing is a literary device to help us use the outside story to understand the inside story and vice versa. The inside story in this time is when the teachers of the law come and accuse him of having power through demonic forces. They say it's by Beelzebub that he casts out demons. And Jesus gives us kind of a, you know, a divided house cannot stand, warns us about blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And then we have on the outside of this story, Jesus' mom thinks he's crazy, and then she shows up to take charge of him. Now, if my mom were to show up at my house saying, I'm here to get you, when I, when I was, uh, okay, I... You're all going to have the story if, if you're, unless you were super well behaved. I remember the time in which me and two of my friends got together and we went, went to ride our bikes down at the creek. And I remember telling my mom, hey, I'm going with Scott and Chris. We're going to go down to the creek and we're going to you know, ride our bikes around. And she's like, well, how long are you going to be gone? A couple hours. That's fine. If you change, let me know. So it got to be time and it got past time and Chris said, hey, if we go to my house, I have ice cream sandwiches. Well, I was 10. Yes. So we all went over to Chris's house, and we had ice cream sandwiches, and then we started playing kickball, and somewhere in the middle of the kickball game between the, the three of us, my mom showed up. And she said, I called for you from the creek, and you didn't come home. I'm like, oh, Yeah. And she goes, I said, let me explain. She goes, get your bike, put it in the car, we're going home. And apparently there was some kind of, I don't even remember, what, some kind of event that was important and I had to be clean and dressed and whatever we were going to do. And because I wasn't where I was supposed to, I made her late and I made the family late. And I, it, they all blew up over something inconsequential, right? Unless you're the mom and you were had. This is kind of what this feels like. 
Jesus' mom shows up and says, hey, look, this isn't supposed to happen this way. I'm taking you home in my house. Just wait till your father gets home. It was a bigger threat than my father actually getting home. Okay. They showed up to take charge of him because she thought the, mirac- the miracles he was doing, the teaching that he was sharing, his popularity was somehow dangerous. And she showed up to to take care of him and to get him back at home where she knew he was safe and and protected and she could watch over him. This isn't eight-year-old Jesus, okay? This is grown-up Jesus who is understanding that there's more to being the Messiah than just being a holy warrior. And when he shows up, it's kind of like the first thing, uh, do you have this? This was the thing that I remember the most about my mom. Three or four years ago, I think for her birthday, Mom, where do you want to go for dinner? Let's take you out for dinner. And she's like, oh, let's go to Red Robin. Okay? You know what Red Robin is? It's a hamburger joint. You get burgers. And I remember sitting down at the restaurant with my kids and with my mom, and and we were kind of looking through the menu, and it's, it's basically, what do you want on your burger? And I remember my mom going, oh, started reading the menu to me. I'm like, Mom, I'm 45 years old and I have a master's degree. I can probably read the menu. And she goes, well, I didn't want you to miss something and I wasn't sure you... At some point, I'm like, Mom, you don't have to care for me like that anymore. And she looked at me and she goes, well, I'm not sorry and I'm not going to stop. My mom was a little stubborn. If you are that way with your children, no matter how old they are or how advanced they are, I get it, okay? This is what we're talking about here. At some point, though, Jesus is like, hey, I'm more... He does something really pretty amazing here. They they say, hey, your mom's outside. I I can only imagine the expectations of the disciples. Is it going to be one of those moments where Jesus comes out and, and we get like a Jerry Springer moment where... Mom and and Jesus yell at one another? Is it going to be this incredible moment of of healing? Is it going to be one of those Hallmark Channel kind of reunifications where um, they have the Scooby-Doo ending and everybody's happy? Instead, Jesus looks around and he goes, "Who, who are my mother and my brothers? And then he says something that's pretty phenomenal. Whoever does God's will is my mother and my brother. This is what I think is so important about this particular day, and we're going to talk about it next month. If we've got to have Mother's Day, we've got to have Father's Day later too, right? By the way, I, just, I will share this. Did you know that traditionally, outside of Christmas and Easter, Mother's Day is the highest attended church Sunday of the year? Usually it's that Sunday where everybody says, well, what do you want for Mother's Day, Mom? Oh, I want my family to be together in church. On the other side of that, Father's Day, traditionally, the worst attended Sunday of the year. Dad, what do you want to do for Father's Day? I want to sleep in and grill out. Okay, let me go back to it. Remember when I said how we made... We allowed women to be leaders of the church because we recognized they already were. This is probably the single most example of how great women leadership is in our church. Not, and I mean capital C church, not our own church. That women will bring us to church. Men will encourage us to sleep in. All right, sorry. Just want to make sure you get that little bit because I'm going to pick... The whole idea, though, here is that our mothers are more than just the women who are genetically connected to us. You know, I heard a statement a long time ago, uh, a a mother who had adopted um, some children and and, and the child was young enough to to know that they were adopted and they said, well, what's what's the difference between being adopted and being biological? And she said to her, her, her little boy, she goes, well, some mommies have their babies grow in their tummies and some mommies have their babies grow in their heart. 
and you grew in mommy's heart. There are women in our lives who have nurtured us, who have loved us, who have corrected us when we have need to. The same kind of women who say, my daughter did it to me the other day, she goes, Dad, it's 35 degrees outside. You're in short sleeves. Do you think you need to take a jacket? Shush, 17-year-old daughter. And then I grabbed my jacket and left. There are people in our lives who care for us, who nurture us, who love us. Some of those people may not even be female in gender. And Jesus would call them our mother, and our brother. In fact, part of the danger, and we see this throughout the course of the Gospel of Mark, sometimes people think just being having the title mother is enough. You know, I, I haven't talked about this a, a whole lot, but I, I think I've mentioned this before. My dad was kind of a non-existent kind of person. He worked nights, we got divorced, he was never around. I never heard from him. You know, I, I sent him a picture of my son when he was born. I said, if you want to have something to do with us, you know, we're open to it. I'm not mad at you. I just don't know who you are. And I never heard from him. Until my sister said, oh, Dad really liked that letter. You should send him another one. And I'm like, oh, no. I, I tried. Part of this also is the warning that a title doesn't make the difference. And I think that's important because there are people, fortunately, my mother was loving and caring and supportive and nurturing. But that's not true for everybody. I mean, we've all seen Mommy Dearest, right? That, that, that story. But even going back, there are other people who simply don't have that in them. Maybe it's because of the way they were raised. Maybe it was because of an event that happened. Maybe it's because of mental illness. I, what Jesus is reminding us here, it's a, it's a double-edged sword in, in a sense. It means that anyone who cares for us and nurtures us can be our mother, but it also means just having the title doesn't somehow mean something more if we don't work at it. And I think this is the most important aspect that we sometimes forget, especially when we talk about the name of our community, which is the New Bethel Baptist Church. And sometimes it's very easy to get complacent with that last word. Well, we have the title of church, so people must assume that we are a caring, loving, supportive congregation. That Because I have physically bore this child, this child will always know that it is loved and cared for and nurtured and protected by me. not the case. It's not the case. I, I remember when my parents got divorced, and one of the things that my mom did that it took me a long time to get over is my mom hid in the church. She loved that church. It was her refuge. And I remember after the divorce, she was there Sunday mornings for Sunday school and church. She was there Wednesday nights for Bible study and choir. She was there on Tuesday nights for meetings, and if there was something, if the doors were open, my mom was there, okay? And at some point, being at whatever age I was, I got angry because there were times I needed my mom. You know, I wanted someone there. I didn't know what was going on with the divorce. I didn't know what was happening. Suddenly, we went from a two-person income to a one-person income. And so growing up in middle-class Plainfield as what I consider to be one of the poorest kids was not easy. And sometimes I just wanted to turn to her and say, hey, can we, I remember at one point saying, hey, can we just like go for a walk? Can we just go do something? Because I just want to spend time with you and being told, well, I have church tonight. And it took me a long time first, to understand what was happening, and secondly, to get over my own needs and issues with that. See, this is the dangerous point. In that moment, my mom ceased to become the nurturing, caring person.
person that I expected her to be. Not because she had, but because of my identification of it. And the danger is, you can lose that relationship. It was temporarily damaged. I grew up, and I figured some things out, and I made, you know, we talked about it, we dealt with it. But the title of mother is something, and I guess this is what I want to make sure we think about in the course of this day. The title of being a mother, of being a nurturer, of being that person that cares and loves unconditionally, is a reality that has to be won over and over and over again. It's not something that once you, it's not like the title sin, where if you do it one time, you're labeled that forever and always. And so I want to say thank you to all, the, all of you women who in various ways have, have cared for, for us, have cared for me, who have prayed over us. Thank you. I also want to encourage you, because we're not done. There's more to do. Your son or daughter may have a PhD right, in education, could have, be responsible for having published thousands of pages, and by Lord, you still need to read them the menu at Red Robin. They will never stop being your child. And even if your care annoys them, it's still your care. Now, please don't go out and annoy your children on purpose. Okay, maybe sometimes. It's still kind of fun. But what we do when we act in that way is we are showing our children, we are showing our world there is more to love than what we have. And what we're really sharing with them is that there is a greater world, let's call it a kingdom, God's kingdom that is full of people who love and care and nurture and that we are called to be those people. Thank you, moms, for all the work that you've done. I'm sorry that in spite of all your work, there's more to do. I just don't get it sometimes. I'm resistant. I'm stubborn, almost as stubborn as you are. And I know there are others like me. And this also means whether you have a biological child or someone <coughs> excuse me, that you care for and love, you have this ability, this capacity to love and nurture them and be counted as a mother in God's kingdom. Let's, let's pray. Thanks, God, for this day that you've given to us. And thank you for this reminder, Lord, that you have called us, you have redeemed us. And that call is one that is continual. God, we thank you for the way that you have provided people to nurture our faith, to develop it, to challenge it, to lead us to grow. God, we also thank you for the fact that as we, as we grow in our faith, we become enabled to do the same for others. Lord, we praise you for the way your kingdom works, that you are able to pass on your love from generation to generation. Lord, we praise you for the fact that we are able to grow and to learn and to receive your kingdom ourselves, to be transformed in body and mind. And Lord, now as we consider this, we also pray that you will help us to be effective witnesses to those who come behind us, to our children, our grandchildren, those around us. Lord, help us to become their mothers and brothers. And in this, Lord, we all commit ourselves to doing the best to love your people as you have called us to. Thanks, God, for this privilege. Thank you also, Lord, for this responsibility. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, let's go ahead and, and stand. Our response here is in scripture, excuse me, is in song. I surrender all. Let's go ahead and stand and sing together. I'm going to keep dropping my um, bulletin so I don't know what hymn number it is. 596.
please be seated. I would like to add my Happy Mother's Day to all the ladies here today. If you are a lady, you're an important part of my life and a part of this church. So Happy Mother's Day to all of you. Even Izzy, you're an important part of this church. We have a Mother and Others banquet tomorrow evening, so if you've signed up, don't forget that, and if you are a male volunteer, I'm hoping you're going to be there because I don't want to be the only one there. <laughs> There'll be a few dishes to do. Uh, look forward to that tomorrow evening. It's always a great event. We also have the Cookies Ministry. May 15th is the deadline for... Uh, I guess the May uh, donation, and the school identified is Edgewood Intermediate, and I believe Laura Winton, Kevin's wife, teaches there, so I'm sure she'll be bringing maybe a couple home for Kevin, or this Kevin. <laughs> Never turn down a cookie. We also have the uh, council meeting this week, so if you're involved in the council meeting, please remember Tuesday evening, keep that free at 7 o'clock, and... Uh, I think we're going to do Zoom one more time. Uh, Janie's not here, so I'm going to assume it's Zoom. I believe that is all. This is the time when we also take our offering, morning offering. If you have anything to put in the offering plate, we have plates at the entrance and the sides, and don't forget your exit doors. And uh, you can do that now. Father, we give thanks for the opportunity to return to you gifts that originated from you. The needs of your community are, are so, so big, and we just thank you for the opportunity to give so that others might not only hear your word, but be blessed in ways that we can never imagine. Accept these gifts in the love in which they're meant. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And now may the God who loves you, who nurtures and cares and watch over, watches over you, lead you from this place to share that love to the course of this day. Go in God's peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.